we have that powerful peace as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, today we continue on with our series on uh, Isaiah 56 to 66, but just want to kind of open up here a bit by talking about my outside garage or the garage outside our door and my workbench. There it is filled with a lot of bent, broken, and busted stuff. Diane asked me to fix her hair dryer after it sparked one time and smelt like burning hair. Well, two years later, it's still out there on the workbench. My daughter Heidi wanted me to fix her two-cup coffee maker. It's out there on the workbench. I have strings of Christmas lights that don't work because one bulb in the whole string doesn't is burnt out. Is there waiting to be going through out on the workbench? I have a DVD player that when you press the open button, the tray starts to come out but closes right away. It's out there on the workbench. My strategy? <laughs> Ignore it all. <laughs> Ignore it, and hey, you know, it'll, it'll take care of itself. I mean, out of sight, out of mind. And presto, after a year or so, the family ever doesn't even know it's busted and broken, right? I mean, for them, all they, all they do is know that it's out there somewhere, and it's supposed to be fixed. But, <coughs> excuse me, there's one small problem that I have, and that's every once in a while, my wife and children have the audacity to go in my space out there and remind me that there are things that need to be fixed. The garage is really a testimony to the things that I have not the ability to fix. And while they still wait for Michael's machine and mechanic market to open up, their wait is futile, and they know it. They've long bought replacements for the broken stuff. As we've been going through Isaiah 56 to 66, we also know that there was a lot broken about Zion. They were chasing after other gods, even were even um, offering their own children in the fires of Molech. Their moral decadence was legendary in that they were taking place out in the open for everyone to see with no shame at all. In fact, they touted their depravity as superior, as cool, as hip, as enlightened. They were selfish and didn't practice justice. There was so much that was broken, so much that needed to be fixed. So the Old Testament prophet Isaiah was in the same position I was. His life was surrounded by broken stuff, stuff that he couldn't fix. He describes his mess throughout the book of Isaiah that he wrote, his prophecy there. And a lot of it centered on the city of Jerusalem. He, for example, describes the city as a spoiled brat whose silver has become dross and whose wine has been watered down to tastelessness. Yuck. Zion's leaders chased after bribes. They sought contributions from foreign governments and foreign businesses to line their own pockets rather than seeking help for the orphans and the widows. Both Yahweh and the common folk were lamenting over the perversion of justice, how they used the court systems to advance their political agenda rather than really providing justice for all people. Like a total solar eclipse, sin was so rampant that it cut out and blocked out of God, all of God's care and compassion for his people. Death enshrouded the city as the value of life was 
brought down to nothing. Power, greed, and cunning manipulation were the order of the day. The Israelites, Zion, was a million miles away from the justice and righteousness that Isaiah talked about in chapter 56, verse 1, the verse we began this six weeks journey with. But where was all this coming from? Who was responsible for all this? Well, Isaiah says it's mostly Satan. Not all of it, because our own sinful human flesh participates in it, but it's chiefly Satan's doing. It's Satan's lies that destroy the Father's baptismal promise, the Eucharist joy, the power of the gospel. His temptations destroy marital fidelity, moral responsibility, and church civility. His deceptions enable us to use, uh, in, in, to have wicked words, to hate with hardened hearts, to lunge after lustful looks, to glom on to godless gossip. And the end result is a cluttered garage, a cluttered life that we try to hide to keep people clueless. But we all know where that ends us. It puts us spiritually in a state of hopelessness. We fail miserably to live up to God's standards. And while chapters 56 to 59 in Isaiah really expose Zion's moral depravity, Isaiah makes a turn in chapter 60 from which our, our lesson comes from this evening. In chapter 60, he begins to remind the people of Israel that, yes, you have strayed, but Yahweh is persistent. He is tenacious in his love for you. He will not let anything get in his way. He will forgive as long as you return, as long as you repent. And in today's text then from Isaiah 60, he reminds us of a gift that God has given us that changes everything, that fixes our lives, that heals our hopelessness, that calms our troubled heart. Today, we hear of God's good gift of powerful peace. Isaiah envisions the new Jerusalem as a city flooded with peace. In fact, he says, I will make your overseers peace. Imagine that. Overseeing the city now are people marked with peace. That's powerful. <coughs> Hebrew, the Hebrew word for, that's translated peace is the word shalom. Shalom doesn't necessarily mean just an absence of warfare. Shalom means to restore, to make right, to fix. God's gift of salvation, God's gift of perfect peace puts Humpty Dumpty back together again. Isaiah's hope is that the gift of shalom begins to take the broken city and put it back together again. Of course, after reading what we have for the last several weeks from Isaiah 56 to 59, we may wonder whether Jerusalem is even worth God putting back together again. Maybe God should just forget about Jerusalem, wipe it out of his memory forever like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. But no, Jerusalem is God's holy city. It is the place that he chose to dwell. 
he will never, ever give up on Jerusalem. He says, one day Jerusalem will be marked by the glory of Yahweh. It will receive his jubilee gifts. It will get a new name. In the future, he says, no longer will it be called abandoned and desolate. No, it will have the name Beulah, which means married, and Hephzibah, which means delightful. The promise in Isaiah 62 to 60, 60 to 62 that, I, that announces Zion's future, that it will be flooded with shalom. This city's broken bricks and busted beams will be put back together again by one who has the power and the authority to do it. One, as it says in Revelation, who can make all things new. And the overseer of this great peace is none other, says Isaiah, than Prince Shalom. Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Jesus walks to Jacob's well in Samaria and encounters a woman and talks to a woman who has been shattered by the broken promises of men. In Jericho, he talks and meets with Zacchaeus, who has been consumed by the world's fleeting promises. Countless others of, that Jesus have, has healed broken and busted lives. His goal, simply, to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And Palm Sunday marks the start of the restoration of Jerusalem. Jesus walks into the city amid shouts of praise and welcome. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus came to restore peace, not by driving out the Romans, but by bringing us the gifts of Yahweh, the gifts of forgiveness, of relationships restored, of being married again to our Creator, of that delightful living in the grace of our God. To do this, Jesus, who is today welcomed into the city of Jerusalem as a hero, would have to be marched out of the city as a criminal to Golgotha where they take people and break and bust them, maim and maul them, and then systematically toss them aside. It's there that Satan stalked, took, <coughs> excuse me, took aim and shot straight, nailing Jesus to the cross. That broken battered and busted body of Jesus was laid in a tomb. But there it would not. It could not stay. For Yahweh is the greatest repairman the world has ever known. In just three days, he took that which was lifeless, busted and dead, and made it alive, fully revived, perfectly restored. And now this distributor of shalom comes to you and me to restore us, to give us powerful resurrection peace. His shalom is delivered uh, to us um, in a specific, concrete ways. In his body and blood, he brings us the forgiveness of all our sins, the forgiveness that starts to put our broken lives back together again. Really, Holy Communion is all about shalom. I mean, after the pastor has the words of consecration, he says to you, the peace of the Lord be with you all. And then we often sing, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us peace. And then after we taste and see that the Lord is good, we sometimes sing, Lord, 
Now let your servant depart in peace. And then to end it all, Yahweh speaks his benediction on us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you shalom. Shalom is Yahweh's last words to us as we exit this repair shop called his church. And who is it for? For you, for me, for the nations, for all people who have been called by God to turn and believe. Chapter 60 of Isaiah is what promises that us that shalom, that it's for the smallest and for the least. It's one of the central surprises of Holy Scripture. God takes Abraham and Sarah, who were as good as dead, and multiplies their offspring. <coughs> there were those who were slaves in Egypt who saw the warriors of Pharaoh wash up on the banks of the Red Sea. Deliverance often comes in small, meek, discounted ways. A little child will lead them. David was the smallest of his eight brothers, not even thought of worthy of parading before the guest there. But he was the one chosen, a man after God's own heart. And then that little town in Judah, Bethlehem, Ephrata, from which the king of kings was born. Indeed, one of the most prominent themes of Isaiah 56 to 66 is Yahweh's assurance that the common folk will not always be um, treated badly, that will not always be set with these setbacks, but it will all be reversed, that a remnant of his people will enjoy the powerful peace pulsating through Isaiah 60 to 62. Overturning the status quo is the hallmark of Jesus' ministry. I mean, he loved upsetting the power arrangements. If you want to save your life, you have to lose it. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Those of you who will think you're the greatest need to become like the youngest. Those of you who then rule should be like a servant. Jesus chose fishermen over Pharisees, sinners over Sadducees, herders over the Herodian, and climactically, Jesus chose a crown of thorns over a crown of gold, a bloody garment over a royal robe. All his choices led to torture and torment, death and darkness. And yet, through his body and blood, Jesus enters our life. He takes this life that is faithless and hopeless and lifeless and instead gives us the gift of shalom that is fathomless. On another day, in another place, he will restore all things perfectly. The entire mess that we have before us will be remade in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And in that place, we will have a life that is deathless and absolutely endless. But for now, today, God has given you the gift of powerful peace. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.